Hello, I'm Stephen Toop, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and it's my great honor to welcome you all to this Cambridge Conversation, our popular series bringing you Cambridge ideas and research. I'll be the host and moderator for today's digital event. After our conversation, there'll be around 20 minutes where our speakers will respond to audience questions, and you can submit a question at any point by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of the page and typing in your question. This event is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. China and India. Between them, they include more than a third of the world's population, 36% in fact, the world's two largest republics, one a single party state, one democratic. Both are countries of nearly 1.4 billion people, people from myriad cultures and religions, and who live in areas that range from the desert to the highest mountain ranges on earth. People who speak hundreds of languages and partake of just as many cuisines. People who are shaped by their nationality, their ethnicity, and their family group. There's nothing homogenous about China nor about India. And yet we see the headlines and the stereotypes, and we often fail to explore the layers below. This applies to our own countries too, of course. We're brought up and educated to be familiar with the prevailing stories, the prevailing histories, if you like. History is written by the victors, said someone, Churchill or Goering, Google at least can't decide. But history is always more complicated than that. History has been taught in ways that suited the teacher, perhaps to suit the victor, perhaps to suit the current political regime certainly not to upset the contemporary ruler. The image of Richard III perpetuated by Shakespeare to support the Tudor dynasty is long since debunked and yet on it lingers. Henry VIII was not only a golden prince of the paintings that hang in galleries throughout Cambridge and here in across England. Churchill may have been the savior of Europe and for that due great praise and respect. Yet in Australia, he's also remembered as one of the military leaders who sent the Anzacs to their deaths at Gallipoli. The Australians in turn forget that more than half the casualties in Gallipoli were British and Irish. On the Indian subcontinent, Churchill has a different reputation again, and that will vary between regions. We tell the stories that suit our own mythology, our own histories. Indians remember the Second World War very differently to the way the British do, as do the Chinese. China and India and many other nations are almost forgotten in our narrative, even though we do call it a world war. It's a difficult concept to grapple with. The status quo of childhood history lessons is not the solid foundation for our world that we may have thought it was. Rather, our history is formed on shifting sands. Each of us has a different history. Each of us needs to spend our lives reconsidering and reevaluating our own history because that's the way we grow. We come to greater understanding by looking at our ideas through another lens indeed through multiple lenses. And that's why Cambridge has a new global humanities program, one that looks at history, culture, and the arts through diverse lenses in order that we may better understand ourselves, our nation, our present, and our future. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. The opening line of the go-between, We've never fully understood our own history, neither ours or our world's. Perhaps it's impossible, but we can keep seeking a richer truth by understanding the truths of others and how they're woven through past, present, and future, how they intersect with our own. Here to tell us more are two Cambridge historians and experts on Asia. Dr. Shruti Kapila of the Faculty of History is a convener of the History and Politics Tripos and fellow 
Tutor and Director of Studies at Corpus Christi College. Hans van de Ven is Professor of Modern Chinese History in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and Fellow of St. Catherine's College. Well, Hans, let's, let's start with you. You've been very involved, I know, in the development of our new Global Humanities Program. How does it differ from the way we've thought about humanities studies before now? Well, thank you, first of all, for this wonderful introduction and for sort of setting out what we're trying to do. I think basically, at the most simple level, what we're trying to do is bring into our conversations, our research, our teaching, our thinking, a scholarship from around the world. I think it's true that until now, most of us have had very good connections with scholars in mainland Europe and America, much less so with scholars in India, China, the Middle East, South America, Africa, and so on. And so we have been building links now with a couple of universities in China, Fudan and Nanjing University, with the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is a terrific institution, with Ashoka in India, that Shruti knows very well indeed, uh, as well as with Diego Portales in South America. And we're also beginning to talk with the uh, university in Africa. Uh, and I think bringing those, those, those scholars in those places into our, our work, our thinking, our teaching is going to be very enriching. And just to give one example of that, as you sort of were hinting at, there's a lot of debate today about empire, uh, but what, what, how much richer would that be if we can include the debates in China about the legacies of their own empire, the Qing dynasty, for instance, or the Mughals in India, uh, or the Ottomans in the Middle East, I think we'll, get, we'll end up in a much richer exploration of what is a very critical topic for all of us today. I think there's another side to this. Uh, you know, scholarship has been, uh, scholarship on non-European areas, non-US non European areas, has sort of followed an old style Cold War model. You have centers of Middle Eastern studies, South Asian studies, Southeast Asian studies, China studies, etc. They don't actually talk to each other. And so to, to break open those barriers, is, I think, is another thing that, that this, this can really help achieve. Um, and as we, in the conversations we have been having with the scholars so far in all these places, they find it actually enriching not just to talk to us, but also begin to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Indian scholars talking to Chinese scholars, which they have not been doing very much, again, is a very enriching thing. So those are sort of the basics of what we're trying to do. Thanks. Uh, Shruti, what would you add about why you think the Global Humanities Initiative is, is so important? Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for, uh, for this conversation. And I think just to add a couple of things, I mean, one very obviously in this pandemic moment, we know that what it means to be human has suddenly become very urgent, both the environmental mm -hmm. crisis, plus I think post you know, in the last five years, whether it's America, Britain, but even India and everywhere else, the global seems to be going through a change. The Davos kind of consensus, the so-called Washington consensus seems very tired, even at the big geopolitical level. So I think is, and above all, I think that the current debates on also empire have become as it were turbocharged with, with a kind of emotionality and a kind of visceral identification. So Churchill could be a hero, but he could also be an anti-hero. And I think the work of scholars around the globe, whether they are in India or whether they are in Cambridge, is to now foster and reanimate what it is to be human and what it is to do to humanities together. And I think that's the first task where this is not coming from, as it were, the modern West or the global West, this debate, but it's coming from these places to bring on a new urgency. So I think Churchill is an interesting example. I was just reading um, a kind of correspondence with his anti-hero, uh, not Gandhi as you would expect, but actually Nehru, who was also a Cambridge alumnus. Yes. And Churchill had, you know, was a single, was a person responsible for Nehru's longest life sent uh, prison sentences. And it's remarkable to see their correspondence in the early 50s, where there is agonism, there is a lot of difference of opinion, but they're also talking about how India might stay away from the Cold War, which Nehru is very, very clear about. So I think that instructs us, the past instructs us that how history can also repair. It can, of course, be the site of debate, 
uh, and, and agonism and antagonism, which it should be. It should be up for debate in the past, but it is also showing, even with this example, how it is possible to debate uh, in a manner, even with those who have injured you, uh, in, the, in the case of Nehru and Gandhi, and Nehru and, and, and Churchill, to produce a new compact, which then is possible to move forward with. And I think the future is really incredibly important. So, I mean, clearly that's got to be one of the most important roles of university, being a site for these kinds of genuine debates, uh, genuine disagreements, but finding a way forward out of them. Uh, another example is, is the pressures that all universities are feeling, including Cambridge, around engagement with uh, China, Chinese academics, universities, other partners. Uh, some people are very critical of those engagements. Hans, how, how do you address those concerns? Uh, the situation has changed, as you indicated, very sharply in the last couple of years. And of course, I'm sure there are many areas in which uh, cooperation is going to be difficult, uh, problematic, certainly. I think one point to make here is that China has built an, an amazing tertiary sector, university sector of the last 30, 40 years. Absolutely fantastic, great scholars in many, many areas. Um, and not to engage with them, I think, would be a mistake. Um, I think what, what the university is doing now, as you know, is to sort of build better procedures mm -hmm. to govern that relationship, to be more aware of the dangers, but not to forget the opportunities at the same time. Um, I think another point to make is that uh, the Chinese pop the PRC population among both undergraduate and graduate students is now the largest foreign student body. And I'm utterly convinced that we could do hardly anything better than to include them in our teaching, to expose them to the way we, we think, we do research, we conduct our conversations. Um, my own students from China who come here to learn different versions of Chinese history than they might be used to in, in Beijing or Shanghai or Nanjing find it absolutely liberating. And I, you know, that, I think, this, again, as you say, it is one of the things that universities are good at and should be doing. And maybe just a personal note, of course, I've been working with, Ch with Chinese scholars for more than three, four decades now. Without that kind of engagement, my own work would have suffered tremendously. Um, and that is, you know, in, in the things that they know, the kinds of access they have to sources. And I couldn't do my work responsibly about Chinese history uh, without that. I think perhaps a final point, I think China has for centuries been sort of a mirror on which we project our greatest fears and our greatest hopes. And we go from one extreme to the other extreme. In the 70s, we all wanted to be Maoists. Um, <laughs> not everyone, not everyone. <laughs> we pretend that we wanted to be Maoists. We had the red book and so on. And you know, in India, that was definitely the case, a big, big influence there. And Maoism remains a big force in, in, in India. Um, so you know, my hope is that we are able to keep that middle ground. We're, we're living in a, in a rapidly polarizing, dangerously polarizing world. The universities can keep that middle ground as open as they, you know, we're supposed to be good at it. It's one of the places where we can do that. And I think we must. Thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to Mao later. Uh, Shruti, you talked about Churchill and Nehru in the 50s, but I know that a, a lot of your own work currently is, is actually a little earlier in the 1940s, a time of enormous flux, of course, tremendous violence throughout the world. Um, but Hans, I also understand that you're working on, on World War II from an Asian perspective. So I'm going to go back to you and then I'll come to you, Trudy. Hans, okay. tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So most of my work so far has been about uh, Chinese history. Uh, coming to the end of my career, I wanted to broaden my horizons. I mean, that's one of the motivations. But I'm now writing a second world war uh, from an Asian perspective, focusing on Indonesia, uh, dare I say it, India, and then, of course, also uh, China. And I define the Second World War as lasting from 1937 to 1955. It's a bit <laughs> arbitrary. Um, one point to make, which sort of Shruti was already uh, gesturing towards, is that in all these countries, the Second World War was, yes, about the defeat of Germany, and especially Japan in these cases, 
but it was also about defeating Western imperialism. Um, and uh, what, what I've, well, the, a couple of things that I, that I think are important. One is to recognize better the terrible times these countries went through, the terrible famines that had you know, tens of millions of lives were lost in all these places. And I don't think we recognize that sufficiently. Uh, but even more importantly, and I think very interestingly, is that the lead, various leaders, uh, religious leaders, but also nationalists, secular nationalists, and so on, were trying to redefine their own nations and their own cultures and even their own civilizations. A sort of saying, okay, the world has now done this. We want to move beyond a world of imperialism. So how do we structure this new world? And of course, in the end, what happened is in very much the world we still live with. So all these new states that emerge out of this conflict yes. uh, have their origins in that. But so does you know more in, in, intensified ideas about Hinduism, Islam, and so on. And so to bring those kinds of developments into our analysis, our understanding of the Second World War, I think I'm absolutely fascinated. And I just wish I could have, I could not be here and be in the archives where I should. <laughs> yeah, so many of my colleague historians and, and anthropologists and, and so many people wish they could be in archives right now. Look, Shruti, uh, the, the 1940s, monumental time in India, independence, but also uh, Grow, gruesome violence in partition, uh, the biggest mass migration in human history. Uh, how has the 20th century trajectory of India been changed by that decade, do you think? And, and does it mean anything for us now? I mean, absolutely. It's a brilliant question to ask. And it's also the perfect segue to, to plug my work a little bit. <laughs> but to really say that, I mean, you're quite right. This is what I've been paying attention to, that how India in the 20th century changes the relationship between violence and politics. Uh, violence is a foundational question of uh, political settlement. And yet we have this kind of paradox that Gandhi is the apostle of nonviolence. He stands against mid 20th century violence of Hitler, Stalin, Mao, mm -hmm. Churchill. And yet India is birthed in a fratricide where a million people kill each other, uh, officially in a conservative way. I was interested in that question and the British are singularly spared in that violence. Uh, so what has happened? What has happened to the nature of violence? Why does it turn intimate? Why does it turn inward? And uh, rather than you know, to as it were the external enemy or, or the foreigner as we are normally uh, you know, taught to think about it, the immigrant, the foreigner, these tend to be the categories of violence and exclusion. So India produces, you know, and that's the answer is in the book, but the India produces a new language, which is much more um, intimate about the question of violence. So, and, and therefore a fratricide would result in, in, in it. But at the same time, it is also the moment of producing a, a conversion that takes place, a very quick conversion that takes place of that violence into a kind of nonviolent dem democracy in India. And I think that is equally significant. It's the world's lengthiest constitution today, maybe up for grabs, but it does, you know, ne the, the decade of the 50s is, is, is one of peace in India. And it, it requires a forgetting in some ways, almost a kind of repression of that history of violence that preceded it. And it's interesting that it's only in 1984, an interesting date uh, for all sorts of reasons. In 1984, when you have the big pogrom, anti-Sikh pogrom in Delhi, that's really when the original violence is remembered. And that's when the historiography around partition violence comes to be. So in a way, uh, of course, it stays with, with India in terms of its democracy. It, it found, founds, as it were, a Republican order, but it also instructs us. And I think it's increasingly clear in the face of the 21st century when we are unlikely to have conventional warfare, that violence is moving much more in a kind of civil war sense. It's much more fratricidal. It's much more horizontal rather than the big kind of dimensions of, that we got perhaps in the last century with the Second World War. But final point would be that the tryst with hunger is also something uh, that India wants to undo. And famines then become, precisely because of the 43 famine, pre precisely becomes associated with colonialism and, and empire. And that needs to be jettisoned. And I think there's been too much amnesia about, so in, in England today we get, in Europe, in Britain to, so that today we get a lot of discussion around empire, but, and it's kind of passionate 
but it's not always well informed and that's because it's not been taught. So my always my trick question at admissions in undergraduate admissions is what has happened in the 1940s? And if they're able to give me an answer about decolonization, because India is the first country to be decolonized after America, you know, they're in pretty much. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> my question. Uh, you're giving away your tricks now. Uh, yeah, it's all over. Parents out there are going to be writing this down for their, uh, for their But it's true, but it tells you everything about the gap between a kind of general corpus of knowledge, yet passions. And I think the universities can offer a really important role in not just educating it, but also, uh, yeah, I mean, redirecting some of these conversations to more productive avenues. Right. Well, we need more productive conversations. There's no doubt about that. I mean, this both of you have been referring to polarization and you really feel it deeply, I think, in a lot of Western societies. And uh, I think universities have a role as a bridge to try and, and give people the opportunity to cross out of their assumptions uh, so often. Look, you've already referred to two of the most influential figures, I think, of the 20th century, Mao Zedong and Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi, of course, never led uh, India, but was hugely influential. Mao, chairman of the Communist Party, Party for more than 33 years, head of state for 27. You mentioned the Little Red Book, Hans, and, and of course all the Mao outfits. Uh, there was a cult of personality, not just in China, but uh, internationally. Uh, but how has that shaped uh, Chinese government to this day and, and the Chinese as a people? What's the lingering uh, influence, if I may put it, of that period and of Mao himself? Well, simply put, I think Mao is back under Xi Jinping. He takes his cue from Xi Jinping. Um, and of course, this year is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist yes. Party. It's a huge thing in China. Um, you mentioned the Mao jackets. They're actually really interesting because in Chinese, they're known as Sun Yat-sen. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> uh, and they have their origins through Japan from Prussian uniforms. So it's one of these wonderful circulations where you never quite know where you're going to end up. Um, I think in Mao, the influence is in two ways. One is his, in the, in the 40s, and I think of him as sort of following up and shooting as, a, as the consummate engineer of violence, mobilizing guerrilla warfare, but also internally in this Chinese Communist Party in yeah. disciplining his own party so that it would follow what, it, what he would do. And he's in some ways more influenced by Clausewitz than by, by Swinzer, the art of war. Mm -hmm. um, so he created a highly disciplined party at the same time that he also radically changed Marxism-Leninism. He decided that the Chinese revolution had to be built through mobilizing poor peasants in China. Mm -hmm. Marx would have laughed him out of the room. <laughs> Absolutely not, you know, couldn't be done. And I think sort of that 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 heritage today, under, you know, is still I think is still there. An ability to have a really disciplined party now, 90 million people strong, again being controlled through this system, sort of a personnel system in which everybody has a personnel file, in which lots of you know, if you had an, if the university had personnel files on its academics. Uh, you, you would have a very quiet academia, I think. I mean, all kinds of information is in there, personal confessions, criticisms, and so on. So that's one measure, one measure in which it's disciplined, but also an ability to make, to learn from the past, often from a disastrous past, and then go off in a completely new direction. Uh, so where that, where that means that the Chinese Communist Party will go in the future, who knows? Um, it can it can switch that direction very quickly and very radically. So I think that is sort of Mao's legacy, discipline, but also looking at what's being done on the ground, what works, if it's disastrous, we must change. Interesting indeed. Trudy, I'd like you to think a, a little bit with us about the, the influence of Gandhi. I think you and I both have statues of Gandhi in our, in our offices, so we obviously uh, think he's important and care about him. Uh, and yet, of course, there was this dichotomous shift from nonviolence to violence in 1947. So Goodly. what's the, yes. Gandhi persists being referred to, etc., but he also at, at some point 
wasn't influential? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, yes and no. Thank you. It's a great question because, in a way, what Gandhi and it's a good segue with also the or comparison with Mao because what Gandhi doesn't believe in is the capacity for the state to either uh, protect violence or engender it. So, in that sense, he's the opposite of Mao. And he wants to sort of thinks about the individual both as a site of violence as well as nonviolence. So he's opposed at that point. He's the only leader when you have the beginning of the fratricide in, in, in the early months of 1947, but actually even going back to 1946. Uh, he's the only leader who doesn't ask for, for the British intervention to intervene through martial peace. He doesn't want an, want an armed peace. He says, well, if people want to kill, they will do it. And it's only after that, after anarchy, can there be a real peace possible? So my point being that Gandhi is very skeptical of the capacity of the state to either make peace or cause development, say, unlike Nehru or Mao, uh, uh, Mao there. And the individual for him is actually the, the beginning and the end point of, of existence. And therefore the question of violence becomes an ethical question rather than a political one. Who should we kill? When should we kill? And why should we not kill? And I think those are those really foundational questions. And Gandhi has a, and I do think he, you know, in a way it's harder for states this is why he's been rendered into an icon. We have all you know, symbols around him, but his legacy is very difficult to reproduce. Uh, it's not a legacy which can be institutionally reproduced, but it's an important lesson. And in a way it has come back to, to, uh, to our century now, because if you look at the works of say, someone like Michel Foucault, who also himself talks about the self, and you could say that's good or bad. There's a wonderful piece on it today in The Guardian, that the self is everything, you know, and we don't need intervention of the state. So, but I think had Gandhi not been there, uh, I think India could not have also emerged as a kind of multi-religious, uh, uh, multi, uh, multicultural society that it has been for a good 70, 80 years. And I think that's important to know because he didn't believe, he didn't believe in the rule of the majority. Right. And despite being a religious figure, despite believing in Hinduism. Yeah. And I think those are all very potent lessons uh, uh, for us today, especially in India, uh, where there that is- That legacy is being deeply challenged right now, isn't it? In, in Absolutely. India. I mean, the thing is now uh, the Hindu first ideology has become part of the state apparatus. Uh, and, you know, 70 years of work is, is, is up for challenge. I would say that that is why I don't think it has happened, but I think India's democracy is, is vibrant, robust, yes. but that question has uh, been, has, is, is on the table. Which way, it, you know, there's an inflection point in India at this point on this very question, which is why uh, Gandhi seems to have also receded uh, from the picture. So you put religion on the table explicitly. Uh, Hans, in China, of course, we don't often think of it as a country that's deeply divided on religious lines. Uh, and of, of course, the state in some ways has for many years downplayed a uh, role of religion. But I actually understand that uh, for those who really study Chinese culture, religion is still very, very important. So tell us a bit about that. It's not really my field, but yes, I mean, I think re religion is, 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 they try to suppress it in the Cultural Revolution. In fact, the communists in the 50s were, were more accommodating, but then they, they changed back. But after the rise of Deng Xiaoping and commercialization and all that, uh, religion is back. I mean, it's, it's Taoism, it's Buddhism, it's uh, Christianity, it's all kinds of folk religions. We've had the Falun Gong, which in the end was suppressed. And of course, uh, Islam in Xinjiang is a potent form of Tibetan religion and so on. So there's an enormous amount of religion in China, has always been, will always be. But I think the relationship between the state, I mean, in this sense, I think the comes actually quite traditional. The relationship between the state and religion is one that religion um, is okay as long as it is dispersed. Uh, it's not centrally organized or at least it doesn't, it, religion is okay as long as it doesn't recognize any authority between that of Beijing. It's not an organized challenge in any way. No, yeah. no. no. and that's, of course, that's one of the key things I think about Chinese political culture. Authority is organized in one point. It's religious, judicial, yes. war, et cetera, et cetera. And the division of, of power that 
Sun Yat-sen talked about it, but in, in reality has never happened. And you see the movies, you know, as soon as there are strong challenges to it, you see them cracking down quite hard. Um, but, you know, you still have a lot of temples and a lot of merchants invest in temples and there's a rich religious life uh, that people can, can, can live uh, as long as you know, they don't, don't go uh, challenging the state. Right. Uh, the Falun Gong surrounded Zhongnanhai, the government compound, which, you know, uh, is not perhaps the wisest political move they could have made, but yeah. So I'm going to come to questions from, uh, from our audience very shortly, but Trudy, just uh, say a few more words about sort of contemporary religion in, in India, the challenges there. Uh, do you think that the, the various manifestations of religious violence that seem to come up every now and then, is that, is that just inevitable in, the, in Indian society? Uh, I mean, I think very quickly, I think democracy has been a very crucial, important mechanism to both contain violence and to, as it were, have a polity based on differences. And that is the problem now is that you have a very, uh, or, or the issue right ra ra rather now is that there is a very aggressive Hindu majoritarian agenda. Whether that will be voted back in will be interesting to see. It's not going to ever be a theocratic state in the way you can think about Iran or Turkey. That's simply not how Hinduism works or even how Hindutva works. But I think, I mean, our, 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 you know, just to say that India has the largest min Muslim minority population in the world. India is in a way a miniature of the globe in the way the staggering diversity and, and inequality that you see in the, in the globe takes place in India. And in that sense, its challenges also are of a global, in a sense of a global scale. And it'll be interesting what happens in the coming 18 to 24 months, uh, whether there will be a, a, a kind of redoubling of a majoritarian politics, but certainly there is a competition uh, on it. it. I don't think it's a, it's a done deal in any way. Thank you. Uh, we're getting some uh, very interesting questions coming in. Not surprisingly, they, they're always interesting with the people who, uh, who uh, tune in to Cambridge Conversations. Uh, let me start with one uh, that is quite precise. Uh, you've both talked a lot about um, violence as a political and a religious manifestation, uh, but the uh, interlocutor here notes that gender-based violence is still a, an unfortunate reality in both India and China. And uh, I'll start with you, Shruti. How do you see gender-based violence intersecting with the other forms of violence, religious and, uh, and political? Or, or, is it, or is it actually a separate phenomenon? No, no, I mean, I think it's absolutely integral. In fact, we just did a big conference about 18 months ago on it, and I'm beginning to work a little bit on gender uh, violence, particularly. Of course, there is gender side in terms of, you know, very terrible sex ratios. And then there is very spectacular, horrific violence in the form of uh, gang rape, which is a very yeah. particular kind of uh, violence against women. So you have both extremes of the destruction of the body of the woman. In 1947 as well, women were the site of forging these nations in terms of abdu abductions and rapes. But I think something quite distinct is happening now with liberalization and India. As women enter, as it were, they become the ideal market subjects. They go and work, they leave the household, and it is that which it seems to be both threatening and needs to be disciplined. So it's a paradoxical relationship that in some ways women are doing exactly what the state and the market is expecting them to do. But there is, a, by the same token, a huge incitement to violence that it is, uh, it is creating. And so I think it's deeply political. It is not simply a social form of violence. It speaks very directly to the coming of women as a distinct a force of agency in India. Right. I remember uh, being in the uh, the central train station in Mumbai when an all woman train arrived. There are certain trains you'll know yes. that that are are only for women, precisely because people are engaged in the market economy but don't feel safe in making the transit from their homes uh, into the city. It's a real issue. It's a real issue. Yeah. Female security is a real issue. Uh, Hans, uh, in China, it's it's a little it's different from that. But uh, how would you equate or relate uh, gender-based violence to other forms of violence in China? Um, well, I haven't seen any women-only trains in no. China. I've seen them in Egypt, but not not. <laughs> um, 
And of course, the, the issues are, I, I think, are much less spoken about, uh, but of course, they exist. I think the most important thing to mention here is, of course, the one child family policy, which led to a lot of uh, you know, female infanticide, uh, birth selection, uh, quite disastrous, really. Uh, so that I think that's that's where and you know, that that has led to a lot of essentially gender based violence, um, and that the 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 end to that policy, the permission now to have more than one child, which is of course the result of democratic uh, demographic change, will be a good now thing. The encouragement of three children, in fact. Three children, even. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so, but you know, the issues are there, and I think in, in that the kind of discussions we have had in in Europe and the United States about women's issues uh, have not yet uh, gone as far uh, as they should have, uh, but gender, sex, and so on. Um, but they, they are alive. Of course they are. You can find them in pockets. Um, yeah. so it, it will come. Thank you. Um, interesting question about, uh, you know, you, you both engage with uh, two of the sort of most ancient and greatest sets of civilizations in, in the world. Uh, how does that play out in a modern context? Uh, the reference back to, to the great civilizational strength, yet the clash with Western culture, the imposition sometimes of Western culture, and now the attraction of Western culture. Is this, is this now an inevitable conflict between India and the West, China and the West, or are there ways that we can actually avoid conflict? Um, Shruti. Um, I think uh, these are what have been called civilizational states. They, they certainly are. And, and I think uh, the India-China story is the story that is going to shape, as it were, the global international relations story as well. It is not delinked. It's not something that's happening out there in Asia. And very quickly, uh, you know, we've just had G7 and the Cornwall story. But there is also the other thing that actually Biden is going to go to, which is about Quad, which is, uh, you know, China, no, sorry, which is Japan, uh, India, Australia, and, and, and that in a way excludes China. So there is a way in which the rise of China as a superpower is being recognized and the global world is re being redistributed. India itself has a very difficult relationship with China because yeah. it not only does have a very, very long border, which has just seen the anniversary of very hostile, first anniversary of a hostile confrontation last May, and uh, but also trade, the balance of trade is, is very heavily. So I think what answers come up bilaterally, but also in these new regional formations is going to tell us where the future is going. And in that sense, actually, this is a very opportune moment to be talk, putting actually India, China in a new global conversation together. A couple of decades ago, of course, Samuel Huntington wrote about the sort of inevitable clash of civilizations, and a lot of people were quite influenced by that for a long time. Uh, Hans, do you see China and the West as inevitably clashing? Um, I think any good historian would say nothing is ever inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> good, I agree. <laughs> uh, and I hope not, uh, but the signs are not always very good. Um, I guess. I mean, there's, there's a difference between civilization and a superpower. China is, is a superpower, or at least an emergent superpower. And superpowers, just like states, do what superpowers do, which isn't always fun. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, but you know, our own track records are not all that good uh, recently, either. I guess I, I would. I hope. Well, I hope not. Um, and um, yes, there are, but there's also many areas in which I think. But there's a difference between now and the Cold War that China is, be, is part of our economy in a much bigger way. And actually, my son pointed out to me uh, today uh, that the NHS um, tests that we all get for, for COVID, they are produced in China. And they have little Chinese certificates in them saying, you know, just, so, you know, Cornwall is happening at the same time. There's a reality on the ground in which, uh, you know, trade and, and discussions keep, keep going, keep uh, uh, keep going on. So uh, I guess I keep going back to my, my original point we made, we made earlier, if we can, it's, if we can avoid the kinds of polarizations that are sort of ripping apart our world today, you know, not between China and, and the West, but also internally, 
uh, we would be good. I guess one of my, my fears, and I would be a little different from Shruti, is that these regional tensions are being subsumed in geopolitical tensions. And we know from the history of the first Cold War that that is kind of, that leads to real bad explosions like, of course, the Korean War. Yeah. And so a certain um, timidity, maybe a certain sort of thoughtfulness about not being pulled into each right. other's conflicts, uh, I, I, I would hope would be a good thing. Yeah, I'm going to pose, a, a, I think, a, a very complicated question, uh, and I'll come to you as well on this one, I think, Hans, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to us. Uh, so it's a, a graduate who's talking about our uh, commitment now to a broader educational context, in a sense, through global humanities. And the question is, is that really just about understanding and enabling discourse across traditions, across ethical traditions in particular, or is it that we as a university might want to advocate ethical standards and norms, uh, developing sort of red lines that certain things are simply unacceptable? I mean, how do we, how do we grapple with that in global humanity? It's a wonderful <laughs> challenge, I think. Trudy, have fun with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Shruti first. Oh, sorry, sorry, oh, okay, Shruti, sorry. Really? Okay, <laughs> you've dropped me right into it. I but have, I exactly. Think, I, I do think um, all these debates, I mean, I have a real interest in Freud and psychoanalysis, <laughs> and I do, so I should say that I do believe in reparation and repairing. And I do think, uh, I think, but that they cannot be, that rep, rep, work of repair cannot take place without actually reckoning with what is happening. So I think to push down debate would be terrible, but at the same time to always just chime in would be a mistake. So we must keep, I mean, I mean I'm gonna sound terribly old fashioned, but we must keep some reflection for ourselves that you know, we must keep some ability to reflect and make distance, even if we feel passionately about X, Y, or Z. So I think this is going to be the challenge on how we, in a world full of speed, digital information, how we actually preserve the work of reflection and slow work that academia requires and bring on, but at the same time repair, and even a good therapist will tell you, a good therapy takes time. So, you know, it's not going to be overnight, but we have to address the issues. And I think rather than the, 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 provo the temptation would be to say, let's not do this, let's do this. I think everything should be on the table. Nothing should be off it. And, and we are not legislators, you know, we are not parliament. So we should also know that that's not what we do. We are not social engineers, we are not parliamentarians. Uh, so I would always want to also preserve almost that old idea of the university while being fully cognizant. I write in the press, so I'm not saying we should only reflect, but to, that's what universities give, is that time to think, research, go to places uh, and, yeah, so that would be my on the roof answer to a very tough question. <laughs> Thank you very much. What would you add to that, Hans? <laughs> Not very much. Uh, just put it very well. Um, it, basically, I think you know we have our own scholarly traditions which are underpinned by a certain set of practices and values. Um, you know, freedom of inquiry and uh, institutional autonomy from governments, wherever they may be. Uh, all those things seem to me utterly crucial. We must defend them. That doesn't mean that we can that it is impossible for us to not engage with uh, universities that have to work in very different environments. Uh, that's my basic line on that. So, you know, I'm very proud to be working in Cambridge uh, as part of a very very long tradition, indeed. Um, and we might, you know, I have we can uphold those, and um, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a, a and. There was a very interesting uh, culinary development called slow, slow cooking yes. uh, and slow eating. It always strikes me that universities are supposed to be places for, in the best sense, slow thinking uh, mm -hmm. and actually yeah. giving us that moment for reflection, Trudy, as you put it. We've got a question from someone in New Delhi, uh, and I guess being wanting you to be even more pointed about uh, India being at an inflection point in terms of sort of Hindu nationalism, if you might want to call it that, and, and the continuation of a secular democracy. 
uh, do you make predictions? Uh, do, where no. do you think this is going? I, I didn't make a prediction, but I did write, I write a fortnightly column in the Indian press and I wrote yesterday that India is ready for a bipartisan politics. So in just the way in America, you've had, as it were, a very deep division between say Trump and Biden and, and then Biden prevails. In India, what is interesting is that we've always had one national party and several 50 plus regional parties. Yes. So it's a federalist structure, but not a bipartisan structure. But I do think the, the Hindu nationalist project is now ready for a bipartisan politics, uh, whether it comes from the Congress or a coalition of various other formations. Uh, I think there is, and it is up for challenge and the pandemic is certainly an inflection point. If Prime Minister Modi survives this, then he'll survive anything. Uh, we have time, I think, for just one more question. It'll be for you, Hans. Um, question about how uh, Chinese historians navigate the political complexities of the past. Uh, can Chinese historians talk about the Great Leap Forward? Can they talk about the Cultural Revolution? How, how does that happen within the Chinese context? Uh, it's very interesting. In the last, last three or four decades, um, Chinese historians have sort of gone from well, a couple of points to make. One is that they, they now strongly believe in evidentiary scholarship. So what you find in the archives, that's what we rely on. That's what we write. Uh, that's what we base our knowledge on. That is where truth comes from. I often tease them that uh, the truth is in many places, but ne not necessarily, or rather, usually not in the archives. Uh, but that's you know that's a debate we can you know, we, we can. Have. The kind of achievements they have made over the last three or four decades have been tremendous, um, and it's really really fantastic scholarship. I think the other point to make is it's actually really speaks to the question, which is a very good one, is that up until you know, up until Teng Shopping, let's put it that way, to the 80s, um, the past was termed feudal in China. Yes. It was all feng jian, and that meant it didn't matter. It was all, you know, all the past. We don't have to think about it. It's gone. It's over. We're in a new world. What has happened now is that the past is back in all kinds of ways. So mm -hmm. people are researching all kinds of aspects of uh, Chinese history, or what they think of as Chinese history. Some people are debating, well, is the Qing dynasty Chinese? Or what if not, then when did China really begin? You know, really very big questions uh, were and are uh, debated. And of course, the Chinese Communist Party may think, well, it has its own version of the past. Yes. Uh, but the past bites back. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> nobody can control it, as one of my, uh, yes. you haven't seen one of my colleagues at Berkeley uh, put it. Under Xi Jinping, of course, the, 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 the scope for debate is much less. Yes. They are rewriting their own communist history. So the, in, the, in the newest uh, version of the communist, uh, the communist Party history, uh, short course uh, produced this year is very different from that 10 years ago in which the cultural revolution uh, is uh, now is, is much uh, shorter duration. Mao is no longer the great guilty person that produced the cultural revolution and even the great leap forward. Uh, so in some ways, I guess, uh, there is sort of uh, in, in India and in China, some of the same tendencies are going on of, of an imposition of a certain type of history. Right. Where again, it's it's I think for for universities uh, is the place to do that slow cooking uh, that might uh, keep us honest. Um, yes. Wonderful. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to wrap things up now. We've run out of time, and we could go on for another hour at least. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all of the interesting questions that you posed. But I do want to say a very warm thank you to uh, truly wonderful scholars, Shruti and Hans, for such a, a fascinating conversation, and, and I think an honest and direct one. Uh, there will be more opportunities to hear from our incredible academics at Cambridge at this year's Enhanced Online Alumni Festival, taking place from the 24th to the 28th of September, and bookings open in late July, so look out for that. And in the meantime, today's conversation will shortly be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.